<laughs> okay. Um, I think I think we'll start. There might be a few more people who come in during your talk, and that's fine. I'll let them in. But um, let's yes, let's start. So uh, um, thanks for uh, coming to this annual lecture, everyone. I'm really delighted to welcome Tamsin Ford, who, as many of you will know, is a professor of child and adolescent psychiatry at the University of Cambridge. Um, she's the the um, head of the department of psychiatry. Um, she, her research, as again, many of you will know, focuses on the effectiveness of interventions and efficacy of services in relation to the mental health of children and young people. And she has a particular focus on the interface between education and health systems. She does a lot of work in schools and interventions in schools. Um, she uh, completed her PhD at the Institute of Psychiatry in London, and she set up the Child Mental Health Research Group at Exeter Medical School in 2007. She was in Exeter for a long time. And in 2019, Tamsin moved to take up this chair in Cambridge. In fact, Tamsin and I moved uh, to Cambridge at exactly the same time. And I was just so pleased to be starting Cam at Cambridge at the same time as Tamsin. And it's been brilliant to work with her over the last couple of years. And going forward as well. Um, many of you will know her as a really fantastic colleague and collaborator, and she's involved in all sorts of really interesting projects, including a lot of, a lot of studies on, um, or several studies on mental health and well-being in COVID, and that's what she's going to be talking about today. So welcome, Tamsin. Um, I, I would like to invite everyone to write any questions they have in the chat and we'll go through those questions at the end. And if you have a question of sort of clarification during the talk, I think the best thing to do is actually just speak. <laughs> uh, um, it pro probably won't be necessary, but sometimes it is, because I won't be able to see the little yellow hands um, on my tiny laptop screen <laughs> uh, with, with Tamsin slides up. So yeah, put, please do put your uh, questions in the chat and we'll have a, a, a Q and A session after the talk. Thank you, Tamsin. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you um, to those who invited me to come talk. It's, it's a real privilege. Um, and I'm also aware that I'm probably all that's between you and your weekend. Um, so I will endeavour to make this very end of your week as interesting and um, stimulating as possible. So um, I want the first point I want to make is just how much disinformation there is about COVID and mental health. Now, this is a living systematic review, which you can access um, via the website on top, and I will make my slides available if people would like to see them. And it's been run by colleagues at McGill University. Um, they've published a couple of papers out of it already. It's a massive team of people who are endeavoring to screen all the trials and all um, the epidemiological papers that have a um, defined sample. So they, they're ignoring those that are convenience samples for various reasons. They use a validated measure, either a defined cutoff or um, you know, just scores on, on a questionnaire, but a validated measure rather than self-reported problems or diagnoses, and they measure it at two time points. Now that could be before and after COVID, or it could be repeatedly within COVID. Um, they stopped fairly quickly within the first six months, the review about change because they were being swamped and the quality was dreadful. And I think for the first time since this all began, and I think I spoke to Brett Thompson, who's the person who was doing this to persuade him to include children, um, I think in May 2020, for the first time, and I've checked every time I've given a talk, the number of abstracts and titles hadn't increased. So they haven't formally announced that they've stopped, but I do wonder if they've decided that, you know, that they're going to draw a line under it. But anyway, last night and also 10 days ago, they had screened approaching 84,000 titles and abstracts. And yet they'd only found 170 papers that fitted their criteria, which weren't, I think, you know, hugely rigorous. 
and only 11 of those dealt with children. Now, the ones that um, dealt with um, children were all from high income countries. There were a few from China, a few from um, the USA, um, three from the UK and the rest scattered around Europe with one from Australia. Um, in the adult population, they have done a more detailed analysis, which they published earlier this year from 36 studies involving 33 data sets in which they conclude that in adults, those 18 and over, there was no major indication of change, except those measuring very close to the beginning of the pandemic when there, um, some studies showed a brief um, increase in anxiety symptoms, particularly among those with pre-existing medical conditions. Well, you know, that, that would seem logical. Um, the child data is a little bit different and mixed. So three showed no change in the strengths and difficulties questionnaire. For those of you who don't work with children, you might not have heard of this, but the SDQ is a really commonly used measure which covers common clinical problems. So it is aimed at sort of picking up clinical levels of psychopathology. Um, it has an impact scale, which is very useful, and it has parallel versions for parents, teachers, and young people. Um, one study showed an increase in emotional symptoms on parent report only, but not young people. And I should say that the data gap is particularly acute for younger children. So amongst these um, 11 studies in children, the mean age is 13. So we're, we're talking adolescents really, rather than children. One study showed an increase in depression, whereas another one showed no change. Um, two showed no change in anxiety and another um, no change in loneliness. And in two UK based, additional UK based studies of parents, so their parent, parental mental health, which is really important because there's a bi directional relationship between parental and mental health. It works both ways. So if, if you are a child with a depressed parent, there's a lot of literature indicating poorer mental health, but actually parenting a child with poor mental health, not surprisingly, impacts on the parents' mental health too, although it's much less studied. So these two studies of parents, one were um, children with intellectual um, disabilities, and one was children with very young um, children, so under the age of 12, primary school age children, um, the latter showed an increase in caseness on the GAD7, so anxiety levels, um, whereas the, the learning disability population, there was no change. So we have a data gap and we have very mixed findings from a limited number of studies. And I guess there is an issue here about time versus quality. So there were a lot of really, really um, rapidly in the field convenience sample collected mostly by social media. Now, you can weight people um, to try and reflect the general population better, but where you have differences in response rate between, say, men and women or people of different ages or ethnic backgrounds or socioeconomic status, you could actually be amplifying bias by doing that. Weighting doesn't completely address bias and might actually make it worse. And often people say, oh, you know, these are fantastically large samples. That's great. Well, it doesn't adjust for bias. So, for example, the example I've given on the slide um, is a study that came from China where the gender ratio of adults is skewed heavily towards men. So if you have a sample at 65% women, it's a very, very unusual group of people who've responded. And I'm not sure how it can tell you about those people who responded and what's happening to them, but I'm not sure it tells you much about what's happening in China. On a more methodological note, all most of our um, statistics that we use to analyze surveys were developed in um, based on a, a probability sample with various either complex um, survey design corrections or assuming that you had a simple random sample. 
So I'm going to tell you about some of the better quality studies. Now, not all of them have been picked up by this um, living systematic review or perhaps sort of slightly unwell systematic review. Um, some of them have, some of them haven't. And I think it's partly aware where they've been published and maybe there's a backlog of studies that they haven't got through yet. So um, this work, you can access the um, report and there are now papers published on it, came out of the School for Public Health. This is an NIHR funded body, which is across um, several different universities. The, the um, PR on this was doing a, a PhD funded by the school and is based at, at Bristol. Her name is um, Emily Whitlow. And her PhD had involved going into schools and collecting data on 13 and 14 year olds, which she'd done in October um, 2019. Now, she wasn't initially going to go back um, and therefore we can't individually link. They have a question about did you fill in the questionnaire last time so we can um, do repeated cross sections. They know who was in last time and who was not, or at least who said there was, but we can't individually link responses. Because, because they hadn't got ethics to go back. But this is a thousand 13 and 14 year olds and was one of the first studies to have, you know, a defined sample with a defined response rate and a validated measure. And I think one of the things that stood out to me is that young people were more worried about their friends and family than they were about themselves, but where they were worried about themselves, they were really worried about missing school. And this is something that's coming out in lots and lots of um, surveys of various qualities about just the level of academic pressure that young people feel. And on the PISA surveys across Europe, we compare very badly um, in terms of how pressured our young people feel and how worried they are about schoolwork. Now, the really interesting um, thing about Emily's work was that over the whole population, there was no difference between um, pre and post that first lockdown. So remember, this was October 2019 to um, April 2020. But when you split the sample by their mental health in, in the October at baseline, those who were struggling um, and what you're looking at is depression scores were actually doing better post um, lockdown. And that was statistically significant. And I, the, you see the same um, thing for anxiety symptoms. And you see better well-being. So across all the measures of mental health, we found this effect. And I think. It, the, you know, the obvious thing that was missing in these children's lives was school and school is an exposure, thinking in epidemiological terms, it's an exposure that we mandate for the entire population. So the very least we need to do is to make sure that we don't um, allow it to harm people's health. And the hint here is that, and from many other pieces of work I've done that actually for a sizable chunk of our childhood population, school can um, be a risk factor for their mental health. The data I'm showing you now is a paper um, that I was a collaborator on. The lead author is Matthias Pierce. He's just got an NIHR senior fellowship. He's based in Manchester with Catherine Abel's group. And um, this is study, this is data from the Understanding Society study. So this is a big panel survey. People come, they recruit people in early adulthood, starting the youngest at the age of 16, and then they've had repeated waves of data. So the oldest people um, in it are, are in middle age and have maybe given six or more um, waves of data before um, the pandemic hit. And again, they mobilize very quickly. You have a defined population. So whatever the response rate, you know a lot about the folk that you haven't got. And their measure was the general health questionnaire, which measures um, what um, general adult psychiatrists would call common mental disorder, essentially it's symptoms of anxiety and depression. And with repeated measurements across 2020, what you can see is some distinct trajectory. So a high GHQ score indicates worse mental health. Um, and in fact, um, caseness is, is often um, 
round round about on on this measure round about sort of 15 or a bit higher um, so you've got two groups with good or excellent mental health consistently then you've got a group that just deteriorates and then you've got two groups at differing levels of severity who deteriorate abruptly, one of whom begins to slowly recover and the other one, um, to a lesser extent, the deterioration is maintained. Now, it I won't surprise anybody um, who studied the epidemiology of mental health to know that the people who fell in the good or excellent mental health were more likely to be able to work from home, affluent, um, good access to Wi-Fi, white, male, um, whereas those who were experiencing poorer mental health were much more likely to be female, single parents, and in fact parents of very young children emerged in the first survey as a novel at-risk group, and I, I think we can, those of us who've tried to homeschool will be able to understand why. Um, and also from ethnic minorities living in deprivation or um, having a pre-existing poor mental health being locked down um, is not good for your mental health. And Kathy Cresswell, who ran the Coast Space study, now this was a convenient sample, but it mobilised very quickly and for a long time it was the only data that we had on children. Um, so these were parents and young people who were recruited by um, social media. Um, what they have shown is a very interesting fluctuation of um, mental health symptoms in the three major domains measured by the SDQ. So attention and concentration, emotion and behavior, um, which fluctuates. So again, a high SDQ is, a, um, is, is worse mental health. And you can see as lockdown restrictions increase, um, children's mental health deteriorates according to this group. They again, children with special educational needs with pre-existing mental health problem and those living in more deprived circumstances all did consistently worse all the way through. Um, and this was echoed by another study um, where there were 12 studies, 10 from America, one from, from Peru and the other from the Netherlands that had pre and post data. Now, some of the samples were very small. Some of them, only, only um, six of them were um, random samples. Quite a lot of them were either volunteers or um, selected. And sometimes the pre-COVID was sort of five years pre-COVID, which is quite a long time. But what they showed was a similar thing. The mortality rate at the time of the post-pandemic um, follow-up didn't make any difference to children's mental health, but those who were living under restricted social restrictions at the time um, that the follow-up data were gathered were doing worse across these um, 12 studies. However, as hinted at, um, and said by a lot of people publicly, the experience was mixed. So this is data from the Oxwell surveys, another Oxford-based group led by Mina Fazel and Karen Mansfield, who's in the left-hand photograph. And it's a yearly survey that has gone on um, since, I think, 2016 or 17, at the the 2020 version had 19,000 responses across 237 schools and six counties. So again, you have a defined sample um, and you know a, a reasonable amount about the schools and the counties from which these young people come from. So you know a bit about your non-respondents. And what you can see is that probably on balance more youngsters, particularly amongst the older teenagers, said lockdown made them unhappy. But actually, there's a sizable chunk of um, children and young people who report that lockdown made them happier. So compared to peers who reported either no change in their happiness or a deterioration, the young people who said that they felt better reported improved relationships with family and friends, 
that they were less lonely and they felt less excluded from things. They reduced bullying exposure. They found it easier to manage their school tasks and they were more able to exercise as they wanted to and, and were sleeping better, which is really interesting. Um, and in parallel to this, colleagues in Glasgow um, were involved in a multidisciplinary study um, involving lots of stakeholders, so police, social workers, infectious disease modelers, um, and Helen Minnis, who's a child and adolescent psychiatrist. And they did a series of qualitative interviews, so a much smaller study, around about sort of 50 um, families. Very early on in lockdown, so sort of April, um, 2020 and then going back towards um, the early summer when things had settled down and what they found was those who were more affluent and they had space they had wi-fi they could work from home actually as described by Kathy Cresswell's data the families were now valuing the time together and actually had adjusted after initial anxieties whereas those where there was either new or long-standing financial housing or food insecurity where there was a history of domestic violence, where they um, either struggled to work from home or they didn't have Wi-Fi or sufficient kit. They had got into a vicious circle of escalating tension and um, poorer relationships. And it led the Glasgow City Council to develop a policy of trying to get the schools open as soon as possible, trying to um, keep the most vulnerable children in school, which I know was a policy right from the beginning, but actually the take up amongst those vulnerable children was very, very low. So a lot of really vulnerable children just disappeared off the radar um, with a consequent uptick in, in cases of uh, abuse and neglect. And it's much harder to monitor what's going on when nobody's seeing the child. Um, so the idea was that you, for these very vulnerable families, that you would have um, either a kin carer or a trusted adult that provided some um, opportunity for care for children and young people to decompress these very tense family situations. So another important Oxwell study, although maybe um, less salient now, came out in 2021 about vaccine hesitancy. So in the 2021 sample, um, they were all asked from the age of nine, would you take a COVID vaccine if you were offered it? Now, at this point, nobody under the age of 18 had been offered it. And what they reported is amongst young people that 50% were perfectly willing or eager to take, whereas about 13% were unwilling or um, anti-vaccination. And in this study, they described the unwilling or willing um, as well as the not bothered or don't know, which was a bigger group, as vaccine hesitancy. So that was common and amongst the younger groups and so maybe a comprehension issue. Those who were less anxious or depressed or those who had probable COVID infection in the past, so maybe they felt they didn't need it, and perhaps less um, surprising, the more deprived and marginalized. Now, um, a parallel study in the um, Understanding Society cohort, which I talked about earlier, found 27% vaccine hesitancy defined in a similar way amongst 16 to 24 year olds and that between 45 and 62% of parents said that they would like their child to have a vaccination. So I think the take home message for that is actually the biggest chunk of people are not, certainly young, young people, um, are not anti-vaccination, they just haven't really thought about it or not bothered. And that gives us an opportunity to get in there with good information. Um, to try and educate rather than feeling like, you know, people not having vaccines is because they don't want one. So I'm gonna segue a, a bit into thinking about physical health um, because we're getting lots of reports, um, both with adults and children of 
considerable morbidity amongst people who've had COVID. So um, I'm a co-applicant on the clock study, which is being led from UCL, and I have to thank them for loaning me their slides. So using the Public Health England database, we have selected a cohort of pe young people aged between 11 and 17 who tested positive for um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, and then we've matched them with um, young people who are of similar age, gender, and live in the same area, who were also tested at the same time, but were tested negative. Now, in both groups, there will be um, some who went along because they had symptoms, and there will be some who went along because they'd had a contact. So we've kind of got four groups within there. If anybody in the negative group subsequently has COVID, they come out of the study at that point, and it was having had COVID before or a positive test before was an exclusion. So the families were re are recruited um, and then contacted at three, six, 12 and 24 months. Um, and we're also seeking consent to link their data to the National Pupil Database and to um, hospital episode statistics to be able to follow them longer than that. Um, which will take follow on funding. So um, at the time of the test, the young people who tested positive were more likely to have symptoms. And the common symptoms you will see are not that different, although loss of smell of taste and extreme fatigue point towards COVID, but that is by no means universal. <coughs> At three months, again, the similar thing. Um, there are no distinctive symptoms that makes you think, oh, that's long COVID. And actually, you know, there are quite a lot of young people who tested negative who still have symptoms of something at three months. And I think these kind of symptoms are really, really common when you ask people about it. Of course, that doesn't help clinicians who are faced with a young person and their parent who are worried about having long COVID. And in fact, what we're trying to do is generate predictive models of who we should worry about. So the beginning of this was um, to see if we could um, use latent class analysis to identify people who are more likely to have multiple symptoms and to be more impaired. And in fact, we found them in both groups. Um, so, you know, although there were more of them amongst the test positive, there were some pretty unwell people among the, the test negative as well. You were more likely to have these multiple symptoms if you were a girl, older, so um, in your later teens rather than, um, you know, early adolescence. To, and if you had poorer baseline physical and mental health, although there may be some information bias in that because we don't have an actual measure. We just have um, the um, report of how they were doing. And also at three months, they were obviously worse with their physical health, but also their mental health. And they're likely to be pretty impaired with problems with mobility, self-care, keeping up with their usual activities and being in pain. It's not very helpful in terms of differentiating long COVID from anything else. Um, and um, the six month data and some of the 12 month data is now in. So watch this space. There'll be lots of really interesting papers coming out of um, those data. So now I'm gonna talk about my own work, which um, involves the national surveys. And we should be really, really proud of these surveys. They are some of the largest and um, best, um, best methodology in the world, although I can't claim credit for that. It's totally um, Robert Goodman managing to get the Department of Health to do what he wanted. So the very first survey was in 99, with another one in 2004, and both of these were followed up three years later with a full survey. Um, you'll notice then there was a big gap. Now the adult mental health survey was successful in um, carrying on, 
But five years on from 2004 is 2009, and um, the country was in financial crisis. And other indices about children, particularly those living in deprivation, were going in the wrong direction. I think, frankly, not only could they not afford it, but they didn't particularly want to know the answer. Anyway, with a lot of lobbying about the data gap for children, we finally got another survey in 2014. Um, and we were in negotiation with NHS Digital because a colleague of mine at Exeter University, Tamsinie Love Delgado, had got um, funding in her senior fellowship to get data on service access over the three years to be able to see whether you know, changes in policy seem to be um, increasing access. And we were that that came through um, in late 2019. So it just seemed obvious to um, go to the MRC and the Department of Health and say, look, this is a really carefully selected and constructed, well characterized group of children. We absolutely ought to follow them up. So we've had two follow ups thus far. And in fact, the third follow ups about to go into the field next month. So the sample frame was um, the, the population of children and young people in England, in all of them, um, Scotland and Wales contributed in the first two surveys. These are very large surveys, some of the largest worldwide. Um, and 2017 was particularly exciting because it went down to the age of two and up to the age of 19. The sampling frame was chosen to very carefully ensure that every child in the country, as far as possible, had the same chance of being selected. It was the child benefit register initially because it was was universal and very with very high take up in 2017. Of course, child benefit was no longer um, universal, so we used GP, GP registration. And it wasn't a simple random sample, it's what's known as a complex survey design. So the primary sample units were postcode sectors, and those were sampled with a probability that was inversely proportional to its side. So in the first two, for example, we had um, people going out to the highlands and islands of Scotland because some of them were sampled. Um, and it just means that different areas um, have an even chance of their population being sampled. And then within the selected postcode sectors, um, children were stratified by the age and socioeconomic structure of the area. So the idea was to construct a sample that as far as we could possibly do it, represented the population of England. So um, we hadn't, although there had been um, a, the initial commission for 2017 to NHS Digital did specify keeping in touch and a follow up. It hadn't happened. And because of that, our response rates have been disappointing. We haven't managed to get above 50%. Um, we did manage to hike it up a bit in 2021 by roping the telephone unit in to actually complete the questionnaires, not just ring people and encourage them to do so. Um, and we have 251 subjects, so either children or young people, where somebody has reported on them in all three surveys. And the aim was really to characterise mental health across time and also to get a snapshot of um, life during COVID with a focus on ethnic group variations, although we weren't very well set up for that because the sample represents the population of England as a whole. Um, and therefore, we didn't have an, a boost for people of ethnic minority background, and they are less likely to respond, and we hadn't kept in touch. Um, so we were limited in what we could do with that, but we did try. Whilst in 2017, we had a multi-informant um, standardised diagnostic assessment that's really detailed, um, involving face-to-face -face interviews with children and young people, and if the family consented, um, a questionnaire mailed to teachers and clinical raters putting all that information together as they would in the clinic to get, you know, the question the government wanted to know was how many children out there need treatment. Now, we obviously couldn't, in the time we had, do such an in-depth assessment and also lockdown initially, we wouldn't have been allowed to. 
So we use the strengths and difficulties questionnaire, um, which has an algorithm which will run with one informant, but works best if you have more than one informant. And of course, for 11 to 16 year olds, we had um, both parents and young people for some of them. And it can give you a prediction, it's called a pseudo diagnosis of probable mental health condition, possible or unlikely. And it involves the individual symptom scores and impact individually for attention, behavior, and um, emotions, but it will give you an overall any type of problem. And that's the level that we've analyzed. So the bottom line is in this sample, we have seen a deterioration um, from 2017 of one in nine young people with a probable mental health condition to one in six in 2020, which was sustained in 2021. And in 2021, you can see that there are very, very alarming figures. And the ones that stand out are the older, you know, the young women, 17 to 23 year old young women, what WHO would refer to as emerging adults, um, and also um, primary school age boys are groups that seem to be doing particularly badly. But the, the numbers are really quite worrying. The differences between boys and girls I've um, flicked up for those who maybe don't know much about um, child mental um, health conditions. This is entirely what you would expect with boys predominating um, in the preschool and primary school years as, as um, the children who are struggling, things evening up across secondary school and girls overtaking boys um, in the later teenage years. And that's partly because there is a, um, a gender difference in the types of problems that are encountered. So you will see amongst the preschool children, um, this less common disorders um, are the disorders where the prevalence is about 1%. And in the um, children who are preschoolers and um, primary schoolers, and probably a lot of the um, secondary schoolers, they, that will be autism and tick disorders. And then by the time you get to the mid and late teens, you'll be seeing eating disorders and perhaps the odd case of um, bipolar disorder or psychosis. So it's developmental disorders like um, ADHD um, and um, behavior disorders and those are commoner in boys. Now, there's, there's all kinds of issues about our samples um, where these disorders were characterized, were heavily male dominated or often that only included boys. And therefore, maybe we're bad at picking up um, ADHD, for example, in boys. And in fact, um, a colleague of mine has demonstrated that not only girls with the same symptom level in the millennium cohort, not only are they less likely to be accessing services, if they access services, they're less likely to be given a diagnosis. And if they're diagnosed with ADHD, they're less likely to be given medication. However, neurodevelopmental disorders are more common in boys. Um, and then you get emotional disorders, which increase through life. Um, and that carries on into adulthood. And they're more common in girls. Um, the deterioration across the years is similar in both genders and um, it's um, similar with age, with the exception of the older young women, which is a, a you know, the older age group is a smaller sample um, initially, and therefore we're down to small numbers. So I'm not sure how re reliable that is. And I wouldn't like to say it's a definite improvement um, between 2020 and 2021. Um, in terms of ethnicity, there's a slight difference in when the deterioration came. And I think what's really interesting is the group that were doing the worst in um, 2017 were the white kids. Um, 
when you break it down into broad groups consistently across all the um, surveys, children of Asian backgrounds are doing better. Um, children with mixed um, heritage were in the earlier two surveys doing worse and in 2017 come in just behind the white kids um, and the Afro-Caribbean kids um, that likewise are, were not doing wonderfully but the numbers were too small in 2000 um, and in 1999 to be really clear um, and I think we've argued for an ethnic boost and I think next time round, if there is another survey we might get one so we can actually explore these issues properly because even those those groups aren't particularly valid or useful either but you'll see that the the white group are reporting a sudden drop between 2017 and 2020 whereas it, it seems a bit more steady um, with the ethnic minority groups all um, grouped together the other thing we've seen clinically is a massive increase in the number of young people presenting with eating disorders, which is deeply worrying because not only is it a doubling, it's a doubling of urgent and emergency referrals with a parallel but less dramatic increase in more routine referrals. Um, now, we couldn't use the, the whole diagnosis um, from the development and well-being. That's the dauber at the bottom of the slide. However, we could use the screening questions, which I'm not going to bore you by reading out, but they're each dauber module or diagnosis has a set of screening questions, which if they're all negative, um, you just skip on to the next module. Um, and so if we wanted to compare with 2017, we needed to use something that had been used at that time. Now the whole diagnosis um, is very accurate in a, in a clinical sample and a separate population sample of 500 children in rehearsal for the 2004 survey. And what we've shown, we can't say eating disorder, but I think those are quite hard edge questions. So, um, these are um, parent reports on the um, 11 to 16 year olds um, and self reports on the 17 to 19 year olds. What you see is quite an increase across both genders and across um, both age groups, but it's more marked in girls and it's more marked in um, the older teenagers, which would be expected. We are busy unpacking what that means as part of our UKRI grant. Um, so there are various um, components of the cross tabulation of, you know, your screening test against your gold standard. Of course, the gold standard um, is the development and well-being um, assessment. And we could have a whole hour's talk on whether that's a good enough gold standard. Um, but um, what we can see, and this is fairly consistent, is the negative predictive value and the specificity, which is how likely um, in both, you know, the predictive value is if you have a negative result, how likely is it that you're truly negative? Whereas um, specificity is a different bit of the cross tabulation. It's if you have a negative result, what proportion of negative results is correctly identified? Both of those are very high, but because eating disorders are fairly rare, the positive predictive value is fairly disastrous. Now, parents, um, as you will see, are more accurate um, in reporting. And that is because part of the pathology of the serious eating disorders is that um, young people conceal their symptoms, so they may not want to talk to you. Um, again, you can see that the negative predictive value is, is very high, but the predict, predictive value, the positive predictive value is low. Um, and the sensitivity of a young person saying, yes, I have got an eating disorder seems high, but if you look 
at ICD-10, which has slightly different diagnostic criteria. The numbers are quite low, as you can see, only 935. And subtle changes, because of our small sample, produce wildly different percentages. So I'm not sure I'd believe that sensitivity too much. When you combine informants, which is what child psychiatrists would do in the clinic, um, you increase the accuracy. And the other thing we've done is we're playing around and we'll do a formal rock analysis to see what is, if you're just using the screening questions, what is the best value to use? Because of course, these screening questions were designed to identify all the cases. And in fact, they do 22 out of the 23 eating disorder cases in this enormous sample. We remember over 9,000 young people. So four or 5,000 over the age of 11 or 12 um, who were asked these questions, um, they were identified using the standard cut points. Um, when you put the cut point for young people up, what you do is you um, increase the, um, the, the um, accuracy a little bit but it's, it's at the expense, you're, you're trading um, false positives for false negatives. Um, and I guess it, it's different if you're then following up with a more detailed assessment. So the bottom line clinically is parents are better at ruling out an eating disorder. So you were a GP or a school nurse, um, whereas young people are, are really important for ruling it in if they will talk to you. One, one of the things that's come out of this work and other people's work is we're not seeing new risk factors particularly, it's just that more people are exposed to them and that may well um, you know, explain the increased prevalence that we're seeing. So if you group un unlikely and possible together, um, you can see there are massively elevated rates of probable disorder amongst those who have experienced food insecurity. And sorry, the, the sharing screen is over the title. Um, so sleep problems, which are can be a result and also um, a, a cause of poor mental health, again, massively raised in those with probable disorder, but this is cross-sectional data. So we're talking correlation and that doesn't equal causation, but it's um, worrying nonetheless. Um, oh gosh, what have I done now? There we go. Loneliness, like likewise, dose response, um, almost if you you've, um, are thinking in medical terms in that those who were most likely to have a disorder were most likely to report feeling lonely, um, but quite worryingly high levels of feeling lonely most or all of the time in the entire population. Again, cross-sectional and there in all of the um, data and at the moment, 2020 and 2021 data are not on general release. So nobody's analyzed them except NatSEN for the final report, um, but strong correlation between family functioning and, and a probable disorder in the child. And as I mentioned, you know, it's very different having your own bedroom, having your own laptop, having somewhere quiet to sit, having support from school or home in terms of accessing um, your education online when it was. Um, but actually, there are stacking of these risk factors in some families, and they're also probably the families that have food insecurity and other risk factors. One of the interesting things we have found looking in more detail at ethnicity between 20 and 2020 and 2021 is differences in experience. And I think this is a little bit worrying in terms of black British and um, Asian British falling behind. And, and to, it's not significant for mixed or other, but it, it's still a little bit higher compared to the white population falling into debt um, as a result of the pandemic. Uh, 
So as well as, um, you know, helping construct the questions um, and shape the report um, with NatSEN and the Office for National Statistics to generate these official government statistics for NHS Digital, um, I got UKRI, in fact, they funded the 2020 wave um, because they acted faster than the Department of Health. Um, we selected on responses um, about access to services because we were going to do that anyway and it's particularly interesting because referrals for child and adolescent mental health services and paediatrics just fell away during um, the um, first lockdown and people in the questionnaire in summer 2020 did report not seeking help when they thought they ought to both for physical and mental health. Um, so that works led by Tams and New Love Delgado and we've nearly completed completed and transcribed semi-structured interviews with our samples selected because they um, reported service contact. And we're also unpicking the detail about this lockdown experience. And we had similar findings to the Oxwell study with about a quarter of children and young people saying lockdown made their life much or very much better. So we've sampled young people and their parents across um, the range of experience, and we're just beginning to analyze those data. In 2021, we're completing the DORBA um, assessment on those who screened positive, um, and um, we'll have those um, results shortly. And we're also getting in touch with um, parents and um, young people who have special educational needs to um, unpick how they, they fared because they're a particularly vulnerable group in terms of both mental health, but also coping at school. Another bit of um, work to come is led by Johnny Downs in the photograph. So we um, got consent to invite um, a group of children from the 2021 survey to sign up to an app on their phone called My Journey. Now this, you can push out questionnaires on it. So we've got some questionnaire data about things that haven't been asked about elsewhere, like self-harm, which ONS is very, very worried about asking about. Um, and then they monitored their mood and um, any stressful events over the next month. Um, and then we, um, have slightly changed our timetable because of um, not wanting to trip up the wave three formal survey. But the plan initially was to go back and do another month with the same people to do it during the school holiday and to do it outside the school holiday. Coming towards the end now, well done for all your attention. Um, this is data comparing the three surveys, so 1999, 2004, and 2017, in increasing um, darkness um, as time's gone on. And one happy thing to report is actually the proportion of children with long-term health conditions has decreased. And in parallel, you've had an increase in the children who are, you know, are healthy. This is at a time when um, the levels of psychiatric disorder actually significantly increase, but it's also increasing amongst those who have long-term health conditions, which is topical for the children's hospital. And of course, contact with a pediatrician is an opportunity to identify a problem and step in and help because actually those that comorbid group suffers in terms of the management of their long-term um, condition. This deterioration in child mental health prior to the pandemic um, was small, but to statistically significant, but it's probably more marked in older teenagers. So we've got a signal both from the adult survey um, as well as the child survey that um, people in their late teens and early twenties, particularly young women are doing particularly badly. And the change in the younger children where we had this previous data suggests that it's almost entirely due to emotional difficulties. Now, this is important because I put persistence in quotes because um, when we we don't know what's happened in between these two snapshots in 99 and 2004, but that gave us a really big sample that we could put together and study three years later. And we demonstrated um, what Michael Rutter showed in the Isle of Wight study is that 
you know, half of those young people are still or meet diagnostic criteria. Again, these are not transient problems. The other thing that should make us all worry about this deterioration is there is evidence both from childhood to adolescence, which is the reference I've put up, but also Pravita Pathlay has done a similar thing with adolescence into early adulthood with two of the um, birth cohorts from, from the last century and has demonstrated worse outcomes. The things that predict persistence vary a bit by disorder, but peer relationships keeps coming up. And that's something that we don't think about enough, I think, in my field and clinically. We should be really trying to help um, children have healthy relationships. The other thing is how parents are coping. And again, we ought to think more than that. So the take home message, I know it's a bit dark to end on a Friday night with, you know, our children's mental health has deteriorated. Well, one in six are struggling. That still means that five in six are doing OK. And what we've seen is more of the vulnerable group have moved into the clinical population. And maybe if we're smart, we can get those going in the opposite way. So I will make my slides available. There's resources and references, and I will stop sharing and take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Tamsin. <laughs> Clapping from all of us. That was fantastic. So interesting and important. And slight, well, quite concerning, I guess. I mean, it was it was already concerning pre-pandemic and now. Mm. Now it's just so much worse. And I think, I don't know about anyone else, but I know many people who will have direct experience of this. Um, young, their children and young people really struggling over the last couple of years in particular. And also finding it really, really hard to get hold of any kind of services for them. Um, which is, you know, again, hugely worrying. So. Does anyone have any questions? There are a couple of questions in the chat already, but the thing is they were specifically about parts of your talk. Um, and I'm not sure whether they, they, they might be a bit too specific to slides. Um, okay, one, one question was the in your um, post COVID or post viral mm -hmm. whatever symptoms, um, someone has said that it looks like the children have predominantly respiratory and fatigue symptoms, but not cognitive symptoms after COVID. And they say, any thoughts on the discrepancy with adults? Because it is true that it post COVID or long COVID or whatever seems to be associated with cognitive impairments uh, in adult participants. It's, it's a really interesting question and one that we're considering. So I have a postdoc um, who's working with myself, Isabel Heyman, Ros Shafran at UCL to explore exactly that. <clears throat> and we're going to use the um, SDQ attention and concentration scale and actually track it, um, dividing the sample into those who definitely had symptoms, whether they were positive or, or negative in their test and those who didn't, you know, so four groups, not just two groups, um, because, Yes, I, I think we should be finding it. Um, I think, you know, this, this, this submission for the clock study was a matter of about two or three weeks, one of those really rapid calls. And I'm not sure that there were questions in the physical symptoms, which is an omission, but I think we were trying to match other, <clears throat> excuse me, other studies that were going on. And, um, you know, I, I, they didn't ask in terms of symptoms, but I think we're safe by having the SDQ, which has these five items about your ability to concentrate. Um, and, you know, I've, I've detected a difference in my trial on it. So um, I would hope that we can pick it up that way. But it, you're right, it's really important. So watch this space. I'll, I'll come back and tell you about it when we've done the analysis. <clears throat> Does anyone, oh, um, Lee? Yeah, I had a question about that study actually, which is, <clears throat> as obviously I have a particular interest in long COVID having suffered from it myself for quite some time. And um, 
I mean, my breathing problems were ameliorated massively once my GP started prescribing me some inhalers. And I'm curious with your kids who have, uh, you know, you're saying you couldn't, it wasn't, there weren't massive things standing out between those who'd had a positive test and those who hadn't. But it struck me that there was quite a bit of arbitrariness as to whether GPs were prescribing, you know, ways of helping with breathing, breathing problems post COVID. Uh, and I wonder if, you know, maybe, maybe fewer of your kids are showing breathing problems post COVID because some of them are getting, getting good treatment and they're, they're getting good inhalers to help, you know, with their breathing problems. I would, <clears throat> I would love to hope that that was the case. I mean, we have got questions asked about who have you seen and what treatment you've had. We just haven't analysed them yet. So this was only funded six months ago. Um, no, a little bit longer than that. Um, and there's a wealth of data that's being cleaned as we speak. So, you know, the, the analysis I've, I've presented is, is now published, um, but it's the very first look at the preliminary data. I mean, when we first started, there wasn't a definition of long COVID. So one aspect of this, uh, that this study has been a Delphi study to try and get paediatricians who of course want every blood test under the sun and psychiatrists like me who are you know less stringent and GPs who are probably somewhere in between and, and nurses and you know to just get a consensus about how do we classify long COVID <clears throat> and it's not straightforward really isn't straightforward. Um, does anyone else have any questions before I ask one? I wondered if the person who asked about the criteria for the categorization of the children wanted to. Um, oh yeah, uh, Margot. If I don't think they're still here. Oh okay. Um, yeah. So I was going to say um, long. So long COVID and Lee, maybe you have some insight into this. Um, I was thinking that if you have breathing problems and you have physical symptoms like that, then that's going to interfere with sleep and it's going to make you stressed. And then that might have the knock-on effect of lowering mood and causing cognitive impairments. So I just wonder how, how sure people can be that the cognitive impairments and even the mood problems in long COVID are directly an effect of long COVID or an indirect effect of the physical symptoms which disrupt sleep and make you anxious. I don't think we can. I mean, what's really interesting was that the mental health of the long COVID sample, um, those with lots of symptoms, yes, it wasn't as, their health wasn't as good as baseline, but you saw that in the group who tested negative, who were also really struggling. And I think you're, you know, that's exactly right. There are lots and lots of factors operating here. Um, and yes, breathing problems do get worse in the middle of the night because your airways naturally, um, constrict so you know it's well known that asthmatics often present at five in the morning because they woke up gasping for breath and have run out their inhalers um, because that's naturally when your airways are at their tightest and you've got any deficit it may just tip over into an asthma attack yeah does anyone else have any questions mark hi yes great talk thanks um yeah, 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 yeah. Some of the questionnaire data which we have from um, families with, with, you know, with young, with you know, young infants suggests that it was particularly the first lockdown which had, you know, um, which had a big effect, and we saw kind of sort of compensatory behaviours from the parents and the families in um, subsequent lockdowns. I was wondering whether that's also reminiscent of of uh, the older age children that you are um, reviewing. I think we haven't got enough longitudinal data, but I think, you know, there are hints of that. Um, and I, I just wonder if, you know, like the, 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 the population mean and Daisy Fancourt's huge um, social survey related to COVID, which is a convenient sample, but it's still really interesting things. Overall, there was a sharp deterioration in that first lockdown. And then like the living systematic review, the conclusion is actually kind of, you know, stabilised. And I think there are hints of that in Cathy Creswell's survey um, with people reporting every month over 2020, although um, she hasn't gone very much far beyond that. So I don't think we can comment about 
mm. you know, subsequent lockdowns. But it wouldn't surprise me because also the, the youngsters, the, the very young babies you're following will be that much older. So actually there's a different constellation of problems when you're looking after a newborn during a lockdown um, than when you're looking after a toddler. Um, so it's quite difficult to make the comparison. You almost need repeated samples to mm. do you know, repeated cross sections of infants in different lockdowns, as well as following one family through their experience. I'm, I'm not sure I'd like to do either as <laughs> someone who's grown up children. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, for example, we've got evidence that 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 parents spent you know, spent spent more time 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 in face to face contact with um, their infants, you know, after the first lockdown. Um, mm. Yeah, yeah, you know. So it's almost like you know, like they were compensating for the lack of other individuals that that, mm. that the infants. You know, I wonder, have you seen anything about sort of separation anxiety and stranger anxiety? Uh, we'd like to look at that, we just don't have the funding to do it, unfortunately. But, um. Because I think anecdotally, mm -hmm. teachers, my colleagues who are teachers are telling me that, you know, they're, the children coming into nurseries are much less socially able to cope. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. friends and, and colleagues I know with small babies that were born during lockdown have had real problems sort of beginning to socialise them because, of course, they have had a much more intense um, relationship with their parents and much less social contact with other people than they would have had. Really interesting. Somebody should be studying it somewhere, I hope. I'm sure they are. Um, Liam, did you have a question? Hi, yeah, that was um, a fascinating talk. Thank you so much. Uh, I've got probably quite a broad question and maybe a bit vague and difficult to answer um, just because how vague it is but um i was wondering if you could uh based on your data what do you think would be uh positive changes within mental health services and provision in cams um maybe assuming money aside or, or something like that okay um how long have you got <laughs> um i think that the quick answer is we have some really effective treatment you know so mental health services should should shout about just how effective some of the psychological um, interventions we have are um, and we're often really apologetic about it partly because we're lousy at implementing it so the um, children and young people's IACT which stands for increasing access to psychological therapies which took CAMS workers who often had had a very generic nurse training to be a, a mental health nurse, which might not include very much or any training, in fact, about how to assess anybody, let alone a child, um, and very little about how to administer cognitive behavioral therapy or particular types of therapy and train them up and then put them back in services. Um, I think we've lost a lot of those people because the CAM services were under such pressure. They were so hard to work in and they've now set themselves up in private practice, which is fine if you're someone who can afford private practice. But I'm sure what I hope you've taken from my talk is actually it's the more vulnerable in society. You're not going to have the resources. So we need proper training, proper supervision. We do need more mental health practitioners. But I do think there's a lot we could do before you get to that point. So anti-bullying programs, there are evidence-based programs, both for primary and secondary. We're just less for secondary, but many for primary. We're really lousy at implementing them. There are horrendous um, behavioral management abuses really um, going on in schools. So if I as a psychiatrist think somebody needs to be secluded there is a wealth of paperwork that has to be done, very strict regulations about how long, who checks on them. Whereas in our schools, there are kids being sent off for days for often very minor things to sit in a booth with black screens in front of them and do nothing, which actually is effectively depriving them of, of education. And there is a huge number of kids who are often slightly 
you know, they've got a few autistic traits, they might actually be autistic who are so terrified of getting anything wrong and that happening to them that they can't actually get into schools. So we've seen rising numbers of young people with poor or patchy attendance or even dropping out all completely, who actually, I wonder if there'll be a large number of the kids who found, found lockdown better because actually they didn't, schools are very social in nature, particularly secondary school. And if that's an area you struggle with, actually being able to log on in the safety of your own home and do it at your own pace is probably much better. And anecdotally on a lot of the kind of parents forums and things I'm linked with, lots of been, parents have been saying that their children have at last had some access to school, which sadly is all dropping away. And I think, you know, so there's so much we could do in our schools to make them healthier, happier places. And that in itself um, might help a lot of youngsters who are trapped, who are struggling. But it's the eating disorders thing really worries me because eating disorders kill people and they are persistent. And if we have a cohort of massively increased numbers, um, you know, they some of them will be struggling for years to come, which is deeply worrying. Yeah. Cheers, thanks. Can I have a positive um, question to finish on? I don't want to send you all off depressed. <laughs> um, I can think of one. So there must be people who, who've come out of this period, not that it's over, <laughs> but who've been through the last two years and have um come out of it positively so I'm not just talking about the people who liked not going to school because presumably they're in a state now a lot of them because they yeah. have to go back into school but I'm talking about so I mean anecdotally pe you know children young people who um were school refusers before lockdown before the pandemic began and who now go to school whether that's a coincidence or not I have no idea maybe they just grew up and they would have gone back to school anyway there was no control experiment but I did wonder whether the fact that for a few months everyone was in the same boat as them helped them a bit and the fact that they got online lessons and so it was a kind of easy way back into school online for them is that something you've come across? So young people Anecdotally, are... yes, absolutely. Um, and in fact, Emily Widnell's follow-up, which I didn't um, present, but she went back to that same group of um, 13, 14 year olds in the following October and found that at, when the schools first opened up and they'd you know, been out for nearly six months, that yes, there was, even in the general population, quite a lot of anxiety, but it came down quite quickly. Um, and, you know, our data is in amongst um, the, the lockdown experience, but I can't wait to, you know, I'm getting little hints, but nothing coherent that I could feed back at this point. Um, but I think it would be really interesting to put the, the flesh on the bones. I mean, um, Emma Somerson, who's a Cambridge PhD student, um, who's analysed the lockdown experience quantitatively, um, you know, what was saying that there were improved relationships with both friends and families. And so paradoxically, some children were feeling less left out and less lonely. Um, and, you know, maybe bullying resolved. Um, and also being able to sleep better. Um, yeah. You know, if you're at all anxious about school, then maybe you don't sleep terribly well when you don't have to go to school or things are just calmer with less to do um you know it, yeah there were definitely in in several samples this group of people who felt actually life was better yeah and i think it would be really interesting actually if, if, similar to what mark was saying to follow up relationships or follow up um family relationships parent child relationships over the next few years because i think that's right that for, you know for some people presumably being locked and shut in the house with a very um, difficult environment would have been awful. But for others, perhaps it was a really positive thing to be to spend so much time with your family and mm. to bond with them in a way that often you don't normally get the opportunity to. Um, Absolutely. Barley Bernie, who is 
my friend <laughs> from university and is an educational psychologist <laughs> says, um, hi Barney, <laughs> says, uh, I guess for me, one of the positive legacies from the pandemic is the national conversation about mental health, reduction in stigma and shame. That's true. I hope so. I think there had been sort of a, a slow change going on anyway, but I think, I hope this has accelerated it. Um, I think, um, I do think we need to do some thinking about how we present it to young people because, um, you know, we have emotions for a reason. You know, some, sometimes there are very good reasons for feeling depressed or anxious or furiously angry. Um, and it's learning to understand yourself and how, what that what that signal is telling you as well as learning how to regulate your emotions so you're not kind of swept away by them is a really important task that I don't think we're helping children and young people and perhaps some adults with at the moment um, and we don't want to go too far the other way um, in that you know nobody's going to have a life where they don't meet any stress so actually realizing that feeling stressed and managing stress is um, not necessarily a bad thing you know the yerk dogsy's curve is that you know you you get a bit of stress and your performance increases up to a point and i think sometimes that gets lost um, i mean you know to give an anecdotal example a friend of mine was telling me about how her 10 year old daughter had had a spat with a very public spat on social media with some um, young people and she'd said something like I hate you all and I want to die in a slightly sort of you know and um, you know without batting an eyelid my friend said you know and three children were so upset by that they had to see the therapy dog at school the next day and I thought what <laughs> um, and that just you know I mean yeah you know this little girl was not seriously suicidal she was furiously angry and yet where are the adults in the system that can't contain that and help the children to deal with that without getting a therapy dog involved Barley did you want to come back in on that I mean I, 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 mean, I think that's that is an extreme e e example and quite a funny one I think so I, I, I like I like that one but I think the, the thing about people like my teenage children using words like anxiety in, in, in that bec becoming, you know, quite normalized and whether that amplifies people's distress because they, it's kind of somehow that's there. That's one of the things I worry about. But as a as a practitioner psychologist, I'm now working um, with children who've um, who've shown emotionally based school avoidance. Mm -hmm. I was in it just uh, one of the young people that I've been working with who has started school after a year of no school at all um, and after um, some inpatient care following a, a couple of suicide attempts that she, she which, quite, which were really quite serious. To, the conversation with her about her mental health and well-being and how concerned she was that people knew about her history and yeah. the lack of stigma and shame that, she, that she's had very good therapeutic support from CAMS. I think her confidence in re-entering the school system and the fact that um, she, I just really felt that she was owning the fact that she'd been on a journey and that she'd got help and that she knew that, you know, she was planning for a positive future and she'd been so, so unwell. You know, I think the, I think, think some, something like that, it just, it kind of gives, it gives me hope to see mm -hmm. when you get the right support, you can, you can. Absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, we've, we've seen that in panel surveys. So um, I'm going to blank on his name now. Um, Dougal Hargreaves from um, UCL, he's a paediatrician. He um, had a master's student who did an analysis of repeated cross-sectional surveys of um, from parents and young people about mental health over 20 years. So these weren't the same people, these were repeated cross-sectional surveys, different people. And they didn't find a consistent signal that um, on validated questionnaires, like the Strengths and Difficulties questionnaire, or the Moods and Feelings questionnaire, that there was 
a deterioration in children and young people's mental health. Interesting, because this went up to 2014. When they did, it was around emotional difficulties, but it, it didn't come through consistently. What did come through absolutely consistently was an increase in, in the willingness or the number of reports from parents and young people that they had a mental health condition. Now, whether that's because they're more concerned or they're just more willing to tick on a questionnaire, um, you know, and I think it's the latter. You know, we, we started seeing things like super nanny in relation to um, parenting. And I can't imagine that happening or the House of Little Tearaways on, on the telly. You know, so over the last decade or so, I think there has been a process and I do think it needs to carry on and I think on the whole it's a really good thing I think one of the problems is we tangle ourselves up with imprecise language so we say mental health when we mean mental illness and that then leaves you know you hear people saying I've got mental health and it's like well we all have mental health you know I think what you mean is you're struggling at, at the moment and the fact that we use the word anxiety to describe everything from completely normal apprehension before an interview or a talk or going into school for the first time or, you know, whatever. And we use the same word when we mean a clinically impairing condition. It, it's, you know, I think we do need to call a spade a spade and to help other people understand the difference. And I think it also allows people who, you know, are a bit scared by mental health and the stigma to kind of brush it aside. Um, you know, my mother is one of the most anxious people you'll ever meet. But she will say, oh, I never get stressed. And it's like, oh, yes, you do. <laughs> but you just don't recognise that you do. And I'm, I'm sure we've all met people like that. And I think, you know, you, you are constrained in how you think and understand things by the language that you have. But anyway, I'm straying into areas that all of you will know much more about than I do. So I shall stop there. OK, so we'll, we have one more question from Lee. Thanks, Sarah Jane. Thanks for your chance to get a second question in. Um, I hope this is a positive question. I was really struck by, you know, both the explosion of sort of convenient sampling that you described, mm -hmm. but also the sort of um, U-turns government had made about funding certain longitudinal surveys over time. And I'm wondering whether maybe there's a sort of research positive coming out of the pandemic as to both the sort of recognition of the importance of more systematically representative sampling, but also maybe a recognition that that needs funding do you think those things have, do you think there has been some to sort of positive shift on those extent, things? I, I agree, I, to a certain extent, but I think we need to not get too complacent because I think there are, you know, th there is quite a narrow definition of life sciences going on around at, at the moment. Um, and, you know, we need, broader research than that. So I think um, mental health and psychology needs to fight its corner and keep not being ashamed um, of the things we can't do as well as we'd like to and be very clear about the strengths and the need to do things well. But actually that can only be done if it's funded properly and it's carried out properly. Um, and I think we also need to... Um, ensure that those making the funding decisions, which is, you know, one thing if it's a research council, um, but for example, the, the survey person within NHS Digital, one of the early conversations I had about following up um, the national survey was saying, well, we have coast space, so why would we need to do that? And it's like, well, coast, coast space is great for now, because they're quick and they're out there now, but actually, they are predominantly white, they're predominantly wealthy, they have access to social media, and we don't know anything about the response rate um, or those groups that aren't participating in it. Whereas at least with the national survey, we know an awful lot about the folk who don't respond so we can understand our data better. Very interesting. So um, thanks for all your really interesting questions, everyone. And um, thank you again, Tamsin, for a fantastic talk. Um, I knew it would be good and it was brilliant. <laughs> uh, thanks for joining us on a Friday afternoon and everyone have a good weekend. Well, thank you for asking me and thank you for your attention. And yes, do have a fabulous weekend, everyone. Bye.